Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the good day and thank you for this preparation day you have given unto us. Lord, we draw close to the Sabbath and uh, I pray that uh, your presence may continue guiding us as we go through this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to uh, our presentation. This is uh, number 19. Number 20, sorry, uh, in the series, The Prophets and uh, the Messengers. This is an appeal to Common Sense, but eight, and we are looking at the law and uh, the gospel. The law and uh, the, the gospel. Uh, I believe a uh, right understanding of uh, the gospel will help us to form a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And so um, it is important to understand the issues at stake. And uh, the Seventh-day Adventists have been given uh, the sanctuary doctrine to help them to um, navigate through this world, having a balance of um, the law and the gospel. And so it is... Uh, if we will understand well the law and the gospel, then we have just to look at the sanctuary, which is uh, a compacted prophecy and um, the gospel actually in uh, symbols and uh, shadows. But that gospel in symbol and shadows is um, enshrouded in statutes and judgments and the law. Uh, and so... You cannot separate these statutes and statutes and judgment with the gospel uh, unfolded uh, or uh, the symbols and uh, the figures and the shadows as they are in the uh, in the sanctuary. This is the only safe place that uh, we can go and uh, find the solace and a uh, right uh, understanding of uh, uh, the Bible. One of the greatest tragedy that has ever befallen Christendom and given birth to false Protestantism has been the disability to present the law and the gospel not as antithetical but as correlates. A sincere seeker of truth who is not studying the Bible to please the fans and build up defense of his opinions will find that the law does not forbid what the gospel permits and the gospel does not permit what the law forbids. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied and the gospel is the law unfolded. But then since uh, we have lost the meaning of studying and meditation, uh, which is our primary purpose to recognize our condition as a sin and flee to Jesus as a remedy, debates and arguments are confused uh, to be a sign of uh, piousness and devout life when the real condition has been diagnosed as Laodicea in uh, our Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. The messenger foreseeing the condition uh, in her day, uh, the, the condition of the church while well, the people were saying that everything is okay. E.G. White had to lament in her day the condition of the church, and you can read that in Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, where she really says that um, she is filled with sadness when she thinks of the condition of the people, and uh, that the Lord has not closed heaven, but uh, our own course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. And uh, she says that this pride in the church, covetousness, love of the world, um, and uh, people have lived uh, in this world and banished the thought of God in their lives. And so grievous sins are, are practiced among us in that they think that the gospel has is antithetical to the law and so they say let the law take care of itself and uh, i'll just walk in grace 
And while uh, this is happening in the church, there is uh, a general opinion that the church is flourishing and that peace and spiritual prosperity are in all her borders. But uh, she says that the church has turned back to Egypt and the church is in Laodicean condition and the presence of God is not in her. If the presence of God was in her, then he will not be knocking at the door to be open because people have taken the grace and run with it and they do not want to do anything with the law and uh, others have taken the, the the law and they think that they can please God with their works and so there's a lack of balance in uh, everything. In the confusion that has risen there has been a look at this God of the Old Testament and there is another God of uh, the New Testament. And so, and it seems that um, these two gods are against each other because when you go to the Old Testament, you see a God of strict laws. And if you do anything, you are punished. If... Uh, you veer off the line, you are swallowed up by the ground. But when you come to the New Testament, you find another God who actually is full of grace and uh, uh, his work is only to uh, invite sinners, eat with them and all do that. And so the law and the gospel, they are said as if they are pitted against each other when actually... Uh, the one is the embodiment of the other and the other is the unfolding of the other. This uh, um, antagonistic way of looking at the law and the gospel has uh, really brought in false protestants in which Christ, grace, 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 and, uh, and uh, the law away with the law. And I'll be looking into detail in the next presentation about um, the doing away of the law and uh, what that really can bring unto our life. And so uh, while men try to work out their salvation with works, they find that they are not getting to the ideal. But uh, we are told um, time and time that we should flee to Jesus and in Jesus is the end of the law. What does it mean in Jesus is the end of the law? That um, when you have Jesus, you will be able to fulfill all the laws. And that is what it means, the end of the law. Many people have lost sight of Jesus Christ and that is why they are trying to earn salvation by their own doing and um, many having been defeated to find this jesus they they, they sin along and say that uh, no one can overcome sin when actually the real issue at stake is uh between the law and the gospel is the overcoming of um of sin and so when uh, we pity the law in the gospel, then we have a limited understanding of the atonement. Why was there even an atonement? Why did even Christ stake it all to come on this earth so that uh, he may die for the sinners? Why did God in John 3.16 give his only begotten son so that whosoever that believed on him might not perish but have everlasting life now why was the seventh day adventist movement actually raised and uh, this is what uh just some few thoughts i want to share this evening not much the seventh day adventist movement was not born to replace judaism by assuming the prerogatives of habit of truth and leading in mere interpretation of prophecies explanation of eschatological uh, and apocalyptic events. It is uh, mission was to practically apply those truths to their lives and stand out as a people who receives by faith the merits of the high priest in the day of atonement. 
their lives was to go before the explanation of these themes of the great controversy. But lo, how this grand theme has been replaced by speculative theories, prophecies interpreted by false current news from the enemy's media, and thou shalt not do this and that. This is, this is in itself an identity crisis, a movement which has lost a knowledge of their sacred calling. And so, Seventh-day Adventist movement was not raised to replace Judaism, but uh, it was raised to continue the Reformation and um, uh, reveal the image and the likeness of God that was lost in man, and that um, in disobedient, man lost the relationship with God. And it is only in obedience that that relationship is restored. And so, who is um, to give us this victory that we are needing? We are told in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, by beholding, we are changed from glory to glory, as even in a, uh, in a glass. And so, God has been so wonderful to raise this movement so that um, amidst uh, the sounding of uh, the trumpet with uncertain sound. He may have a people who understand the relationship between the law and the gospel and that uh, the other is not uh, 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 an antagonistic uh, uh, to the other. And so we are living in a uh, we are, we are living in the days when um, God is not revered as he should. Because when you look in the Old Testament, when somebody sinned, immediate punishment followed. But when you look in the New Testament, it is like judgment is deferred and so the sinners are hardened in their sin and they think that they shall not never be um, uh, uh, judgment that uh, shall come. It, it is only because of the masses of God that um, we are really not consumed. It is because of the masses of God that um, we are really not consumed. But if the Lord will visit us and render to us the way that we should be rendered unto, then uh, we shall find ourselves in uh, uh, a place just like the Old Testament people were. And so, uh, talking about uh, the people thinking that there was an abolished law, let us look at this issue that um, the law was abolished. And if the law was abolished, let us see what it may result by our belief in such a thing that the law was um, uh, abolished. Now, think about this. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but uh, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy main servant, nor thy my thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger, that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Those who do not want to feed, to lift the cross and obey God's holy Sabbath according to the commandment will be greatly relieved to have the whole law swept out of existence. And the Sabbath in particular for keeping God's specified day makes it inconvenient if they are engaged in business. Frequently, there is loss in bringing one's business into such a shape that he will not violate the Sabbath. And to have his conscience lightened by ministers, assuring him that God's law is abolished, make it convenient for him in every way. This is a doctrine that is pleasant to receive. There is no cross in it, no self-denial. No self-sacrifice. A man may work all days of the week if he pleases and give no day to the service of God or to devotion. The human heart not subject to the law of God looks upon this as an admirable arrangement. The law has been done away. And so if you take away then the Sabbath, 
you can go on do whatever you do and uh, where is the gospel of um, recreation and sanctification that comes with the sabbath there is no gospel of sanctification and recreation and so you do away with the law you do away with the gospel of sanctification and recreation the fifth commandment reads honor thy father and thy mother that thy days be long upon the land which the lord thy god giveth the exodus 20 12. Children have heard this often times repeated to them when they were headstrong, disobedient, unthankful, disrespectful, selfish. But what a relief it, but what a relief it is to be told by one who claims to be sanctified, a teacher of Bible truth that they need not to keep the commandment any longer. For if they keep it, it is an evident that they have fallen from grace. The commandment is gone by the board with the other nine commandments. Now, children are no longer under the law, but under grace. What freedom they feel to know that this commandment will no longer be a yoke of bondage, binding them to rules in regard to the fulfillment of their duty towards their parents and that they may steal their property and leave them in need. And so you find that that commandment is abolished, number five. And then there goes the respect even for the elderly. And so where is the moral value? Where, where is the ethics in a young child disrespecting his parents because the fifth commandment is done away with. You go away with the, the fifth commandment and there you have their respect and ethics gone. The sixth commandment reads, Thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, 13. What a weight is lifted from the conscience of the murderer that this commandment is to no longer be a restriction to him. He has long wished that no such a commandment had been given. And now a teacher of Bible doctrine who claims he has not committed a sin of four years has brought him this his portion of meat in due season for he has told him that the law was abolished. Now he can breathe more freely even if he has stained his hands in his neighbor's blood. It is not so dreadful a matter to kill when he knows there is no command for me forbidding murder. And you know in Matthew chapter 5 we are told that if you hate your brother in your heart, you have you are committing murder or you have committed murder. Now, look at um, the seventh commandment. It reads, thou shalt not commit adultery, Exodus 20, 14. The vile man who will steal his neighbor's wife, who has not the restraining influence upon his licentious passions, is much relieved when men who say they are holy ministers, who have been preaching for years, tell him this law has been abolished. That is such an agreeable doctrine to his carnal, polluted soul. He hails it with great joy and is happy. All the compactions of conscience are gone, for when there is no law, there is no transgression. And he pursues his cause of uncleanness, although he may claim to be a minister of the gospel. He is turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ, Jude 4. These deny the Lord Jesus in life and character. They are servants of sin while claiming to be teaching the Bible to the people. Now, thou shalt not commit adultery. This um, uh, sexual promiscuousness. Jesus has one church which he is faithful unto. And he expects that the family relation should reveal this by man having only one wife. Once, now listen to this, once we take away the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. There you destroy the divine pattern, the image of God in Genesis 1.26 and the likeness of God. For the likeness of, the, of God is to exercise his character upon his faithful church, which is one. And the image of God is the image of one Jesus Christ with one church, one husband with one wife. And so you destroy the image and you destroy the likeness, which is more of a character. You do away with that commandment and what you have done away is the character of God, which is to show his supreme love of ob uh, his uh, object of supreme love to one church and to one wife. And so the commandment and the pro sexual mis. Uh, the breaking of the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and any sexual promiscuousness actually destroys Genesis 1, 26 and 27. You destroy the image. There is one man, one wife, one Christ, one church, and the likeness of God, his character of love to 
this chart. The abol abolished law. Look at it again. Um, now, the Eighth Commandment reads, Thou shalt not steal, Exodus 2015. The thief has felt restricted by this commandment. It was a yoke of bondage to him. He wanted to appropriate his neighbor's goods and being bound about with the fetters of the Eighth Commandment was very grievous to him. But he has had a pleasant repast meet in due season. The ministers who understand the matter better than he does tell him, there is no commandment to this effect. It has not been binding for more than 1800 years, so that all his scruples were unnecessary. He could now be free to steal without that hated eighth commandment um, condemning his cause. And you can go about taking everything and uh, teaching everyone to take everything because there is no, no, no commandment like uh, thou shalt not steal. The ninth commandment reads, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Exodus 2016. This commandment is exceedingly offensive to the man who has educated and trained himself in this um, kind of work. He loves it and it has become a part of his nature to seek sport and stain in his neighbor. He has become an expert in misrepresentation. In falsifying, he has learned his trade. He is an expert in this business. And when he, has, and when he has, brings to the, his ears a bit of scandal, it is as sweet a morsel. He will use it to hurt and injure his neighbor, and in this work he claims to be doing God's service. He may even claim to be sanctified while doing his special work for Satan. Satan was an accused of the brethren. He accused them before God day and night, and there are those who love this favorite business of their master and will do it zealously for him and exult in their adaptness at the work. Master and servant will unite, and the reward they will receive is in accordance with their deeds. Root and branch bear the same kind of fruit, and it is very convenient that the ninth commandment is no more enforced for it will hem him about with it is restriction. Now he can falsify and misrepresent and make good appear evil and evil good and without fear of condemnation. How convenient to make a raid against the commandments of God, saint and sinners working in the same line. And you know from um, Deuteronomy chapter 19 that um, and uh, Revelation chapter 12, the reason why Satan was banished here down is he was a tail bearer. And now remove that commandment and you are no longer on the side of God, but you are on the side of Satan. The 10th commandment reads, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maid servant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Exodus 20, 17. How convenient is such a principle? This commandment is a wonderful restriction of liberty. It is a terrible yoke of bondage and the dishonest man the covetous man could not follow out his inclination with any peace while this law was standing against him. It is such a relief to be free from this condemnation and rejoice in the liberty of the gospel that men cannot be so terribly fat fettered. And now that the ministers declare this commandment null and void, they feel so great freedom in the gospel. And they have to do, and all they have to do is to believe, believe. The keeping of the commandment is altogether necessary, and if they keep them, they are under a yoke of bondage. They'll have fallen from grace. And so you hear such a things that grace, grace, live alone the commandments. And this gives the liberty to covet and do all these things and still claim that um, you have the liberty of the gospel because you are not under the law, but under the grace. And this is the kind of the gospel that is, uh, this is the kind of um, insinuations that are made when you place the law and the gospel to be antagonistic to each other. And so what a blessed freedom to the sinner this no law system is. It is, it is benefits cannot be really estimated by those who keep God's commandment. They are yoked under restriction. Can we wonder that under the ministry of those who make void the law of God and trample it under their feet, the world is corrupted, that religion is defiled, that sin runs riot? Can we not see that there is no law, there is no sin, for sin is the transgression of the law? First John 3, 4 gives the only definition of, in the Bible of sin, sin is the transgression of the law. Jude rise to his brethren to be consistent in the profession of their faith. Jude, the servant of Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. 
mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligent right unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should honestly condemn for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jesus himself says, uh, I have kept my father's commandment, John 15, 10. Then what should we do but keep the commandments of God? Jesus did not break one of the Ten Commandments. He taught all who came unto him their duty in this respect. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. And here is where we can prove Jesus is God. Because there is one, none good but one that is God. And so... Jesus Christ being good and there being no one who is good but God then makes him God by nature, of course. But if thou wilt enter into the life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth. What luck I yet? Jesus now points to the plague spot of his heart, showing him he had not kept the commandments as he thought he had done. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession, Matthew 19, 16 to 22. We can see... We can hear see clearly that Christ was referring to the moral law. If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, verse 17. But um, Elder Grant answers the questioner in altogether different manner. He will say, if you will enter into life, believe, believe. If you keep the law, you are in bondage and have fallen from grace. The law is not binding on men. It is a yoke of bondage. And uh, that is uh, a long read from uh, Letters, Letters and Manus Manuscript, Volume 4, Manuscript 23, 18. 85. And so, um, you see, the issue of fitting the law against the gospel, actually, what only it brings you is bondage in sin, not freedom from sin. Because now you think that you are freed from the law and you do everything that is sinful. But what is the remedy for all these things? Jesus says, Look unto me and live. In Hebrews chapter 8, he says that I'll write my law upon your heart and I'll sprinkle water that you may not continue worshipping your idols, but um, you may be cleansed from your idols and you may serve the living God. So the sprinkling of the water, the giving of the heart of flesh, the removing of the heart of stone, it is for what reason? that you may serve the Lord. What is serving the Lord? Being subject unto his kingdom. But we cannot be subject to the kingdom of God if we do not have Christ in our heart. And the legalistic way of keeping the law, the letter of the law without the spirit of the law, is the one that has made even the gospel be hard to be comprehended. And so how I pray that uh, we shall not enter into this false security that the law has been the law uh, is uh, against the gospel and the gospel is against the law but uh, we shall see that uh, the, um, the the law is the gospel embodied and the gospel is the law unfolded and you cannot separate these two that is what I just wanted to bring to you this evening and uh, may the Lord continue blessing us we don't have to be like the Nicolaitans who did away with the law by singing grace, grace, grace. And so may the Lord keep you and uh, may he continue blessing you. And uh, uh, I pray that um, we shall walk in the ways of the Lord. In First John chapter six, 2 verse 6, it says that uh, whoever says that he abides in him must walk as even he walked. With his strength, we can go from one step to another climbing the ladder upward and reaching even the stature and the measure of the man Jesus Christ in him, not by ourselves. Shall we pray?
Thank you, Heavenly Father, because um, your commandments are not grievous. Um, and Lord, for those who are in thee, this is the mystery unfolded, Christ in us, the hope of glory, that we may be cleansed from our idols, we may be cleansed from uh, our contradictions, and Lord, that we may live to serve the living God. Thank you for this uh, hour, and uh, continue blessing your people. Continue helping us to grow day by day. And Lord, that uh, we may not look at this commandment, but we may look at the main object, which is Jesus Christ, and in him be able to fulfill the law of righteousness. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May God be with you and keep you until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.